Hello everyone, and welcome to this lecture on African American Identity and Popular Culture, Part 2. So in the first part of the lecture, we really looked at the legal history and kind of what was going on in popular culture. In this mini lecture, we're just going to take some time looking at specific representations or, or specific artifacts of popular culture, just to give you a sense of you know what these were and, and dig a little bit deeper, at least see some uh, representations of those. So just a heads up that uh, you know some of the imagery here within this presentation it contains offensive and uncomfortable material. Uh, you are not required to look at it and if you're uncomfortable you you're welcome to you know minimize the screen look away or even skip this presentation. I would encourage you to look at this only because I feel to understand the full impact and what we're talking about when we're talking about you know the legacy of uh, popular cultures representations misrepresentations and stereotypes of African American ident of African Americans it's important to understand how deep this went so first we'll take a look at blackface minstrelsy. Uh, we see a variety of, uh, of different forms of blackface minstrelsy and some would argue that in some ways it's still present today in certain forms but blackface minstrelsy typically ha contained white actors dressing up and painting themselves black. Uh, we saw this, uh, we kind of saw a rendering of this when we watched Bamboozled in the course uh, but going on to stage and performing representations or we should say misrepresentations of black identity and again we have to remember that these traveling minstrel shows would often visit places or could often visit places where many people may not have had first-hand contact with African Americans and so these kinds of you know this show could often served as a developing a a stereotypical depiction of blacks for people that had never met them and so that's their only basis for understanding African Americans and of course that would probably lead to a certain amount of uh, apathy and disinterest in say the freeing of African Americans or uh, aspiring or, or believing in equality with among the different races and the like. A more, I, uh, I, should, I should say an equally problematic or, or even more problematic was the rise of lynchings in Jim Crow era and beyond um, and lynching souvenirs. Uh, these were of course pictures. Um, I'm, you know, I, there is some literature about actual artifacts from the place whether it's branches from the trees or, or even uh, body parts but uh, you know lynching souvenirs of taking pictures and we have to remember you know if we're dealing in the 1800s and even the early 1900s taking a picture was a process. It was not snap it with your cell phone in less than two seconds and done. It was you had to stand there for upwards of a minute for the exposure to work, for the picture to be captured right. Sometimes the picture, is, several pictures were needed. Uh, so these were, these weren't just casual, you know, snapshots. These were consciously composed images that everybody was involved in and I would encourage you to think about that as you look at the audience or you look at the people in the picture and kind of what they're doing and how they're posing. Um, so here's a here's a you know fascinating one in which people are you know they're looking at the camera um, we see some with smiles we see you know others just trying to look at clearly it's at night and there's bright lights um, and yet, look at all of these people that are at this event. Look at all, you know, this is a large group of people that are just in the camera. Uh, herein, you know, we see kind of the community response, or, or herein we see one of those, um, the souvenirs that I was talking about. This was actually a, um, a postcard. So they not only took a picture, but they turned it into a postcard that was then sent out. And if you can make out the language last night, this is the barbecue we had last night. Um, you know, my picture is to the left with a cross over, uh, over it. Your, your son, Joe, right? So, the, I mean, this is, these are the things that are being sent along. They're very disturbing images, and you know the disturbing is is certainly to be held within the body, but also I think the the people there, uh, the people that have attended this event. So, 
you know, when we talk about lynching, you know, lynching was was something horrific that happened, and yet it also became a dynamic or a piece of or, or created these artifacts within popular culture. You know, the camera and what the camera meant or what you could do with a camera. You could capture these things and share them. Um, you know, we think today that sounds that sounds revolting, and so this has to, you know, looking at some of those images has to help us understand, you know, what was going on in terms of identity, in terms of culture, and really question representation within culture. And, you know, what happens when people's lives, people's bodies are commodities to commemorate um, as part of entertainment to some degree, as part of a, you know, a, a moment for a community, for their and are, you know for their enjoyment um, in, in enjoyment it's kind of a challenge word there but you know people smiling at a picture people going to this event people using this as a means of you know look what I did um, there's an enjoyment there is an enjoyment there that that's certainly problematic so we have that and then of course as we move into um, you know film and radio as I like to say these are often white depictions of African Americans and so it is problematic it is not necessarily representational uh, we do see a lot of challenges or problems around said representation we talked about already several times the birth of a nation and you know again when you watch this film the 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 representation of African Americans is quite challenging you can see from the title um, you know, and this was you know quoted from Woodrow Wilson within the film. You know, the white men roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation, self-preservation, until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country, right? And this idea that the South needs to be saved from African Americans. Um, it's a very strong sentiment that we see rise up uh, after Reconstruction and throughout the early 19th. So, uh, 1900s. We mentioned the jazz singer. We have Al Jolson and his character, who is uh, who is Jewish and is performing whiteface. And we can see there, you know, we're moving into film. Uh, you know, we move into film. This is in the 1920s, right? Less than a hundred years ago, and these are still ways in which African Americans are depicted or certainly being presented. Now, in the film, everybody knows Al Jolson is is not African American and yet there's you know the songs that he sings and his stage character are still presenting a form of black or African American identity. King Kong as I've said uh, elsewhere is definitely a film steeped in race and we have you know that image of the ape character holding the the woman Faye, uh, is it Faye Darrow or yeah Faye Darrow I think um, it's, you know, holding her uh, as a possession, and we can see within the film this ape character. He is taken from this supposedly, uh, this supposed from Skull Island, which is supposed to be in somewhere in the Pacific, and yet the characters on Skull Island are all, they all appear as African uh, of people of African descent, and here we have King Kong, who is he is ultimately captured enslaved right he's put into chains brought to new york put on display and then he breaks out and he goes after the uh the the character of uh, fay ray that's who it was goes after fay ray and you know that there there's a lot of motifs within this film that would have us read king kong as black um there's been a lot of things written about that uh that are worth checking out Mention again, uh, Gone with the Wind, more romanticizing of the South and the uh, Southern plantation owner. And, you know, here we have a depiction of slavery in which you almost feel, you know, the film presents slavery in such a way that you almost feel bad that the slaves are going to be free. And that kind of logic is just crazy, right? Because if we understand the, the institution of slavery, the dehumanization that takes place, uh, this idea that we should somehow feel bad or sympathetic for the loss of slavery as an institution is, is challenging and problematic. As I mentioned before, Amos and Andy, 
Uh, so if we look on the right, these were some of the original actors uh, that were meant to portray uh, Amos and Andy, and they are in blackface, as you can see, versus on the left, where uh, on the television show they do eventually have uh, actual African-American actors. Uh, as I said before, the, the, the radio show was performed uh, for a long time for by... by um, by white voice actors, and I think you could almost call that white voice or, or black voice minstrelsy in the ways in which orally they depicted or misrepresented African Americans. A really interesting take, uh, a really in interesting example in 1965 was Lawrence Olivier, a very famous Shakespearean actor, does Othello. And he essentially does Othello in blackface, he paints himself black. And this is fascinating. Again, 1965, now we're talking only about 50 years ago. And rather than have an African American or a person of, or an African play Othello in, in Shakespeare's Othello, who is supposed to be black, they take Laurence Olivier and paint him black. Right? So the, the, this idea that you could not have that in a in you know film or in in traditional theater uh still 50 years ago seemed challenging seemed you know something hard to overcome um i skipped roots but that would be another one from 1977 1986 we have soul man uh and again here a student a, a white student essentially changes himself to appear black so that he can get into the college that he wants to. Uh, and this is this is a problematic film. This film plays upon this idea that with, uh, with affirmative action, it all of a sudden became easy for people, for minorities, to get into colleges. And that's just not true. Um, we still see overwhelmingly, you know, traditional... You know, traditionally white and white male and female as people at college. There's still an overwhelming um, population there. We're, we don't necessarily see the equal representation across college campuses as we do see, say, across the population in general. Um, but this is one of those films that contributed to this idea of oh, you know, a minority can easily get in because they can, you know, play quote-unquote the race card or because of affirmative action the doors open will, is wide open and in fact it's just the truthfulness of that is completely non-existent and much of the research shows um, that it that's just not a truth but here's a film that largely presents that uh, 1992 the LA riots uh, as a result of the Rodney King trial and uh, the kind of the, the fallout of that and the ways in which uh, African Americans and other minorities within LA did riot and did, you know, rise up against what they saw as institutional injustices. And this was one of those that was really played on the news media. I can remember growing up. I, I mean, I was I was about 13 at the time, seeing this on the TV and seeing it played regularly. It was it was a fascinating and crazy thing to see, you know how it was depicted, who, you know, who was at fault and how fault, you know, and how people were talked about on television. You can still go back and look at clips from this and it, that, again, looking at how people use language it, to talk about different groups within this event was fascinating. And of course, the O.J. Simpson trial two years later, um, you know, a, 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 a trial that largely launched court TV and this obsession and interest with O.J. Simpson and so much of the talk again around race that played into the trial, uh, the the dynamics of the LAPD and uh, just the fact that the 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 trial itself became such a focal point within popular culture for years to come. And I think, you know, we, we've seen many other things um, over the last few years, but the, the Trayvon Martin case, and again, you know, how that as a, as a cultural, uh, you know, within popular culture, if people were paying attention in 2012, um, in, in 2013, when the, when the case um, for this w was being 
when the trial was going on for this, you know, it was fascinating to see people in solidarity of all different backgrounds wearing the hoodie and putting that hoodie up, you know, putting a picture of themselves in a hoodie up as their Facebook profile or, try, you know, there was a lot of different ways in which this became, again, a dynamic within popular culture. People wearing t-shirts uh, for Trayvon Martin, people, you know, embracing Skittles because that's what he was going out or I don't remember if that's what he had in his pocket or that's what he was he was going out for. Um, so there was a there was a fascinating moment within popular culture as a response to this, which is also fa you know which is uh, will continue to be written about I'm sure for the next you know for the next twenty years. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much. I hope this gave you some you know really some good ideas about what we're talking about, some more solid examples within the culture. All right, thank you very much. See you next time.